yes yes arjun let me first let me first open my ppt uh नेहा सर को भी बोलना प्लीज ज्वाइन करने को नाउ शेयर स्क्रीन सो आई शुड आई शेयर माय स्क्रीन आफ्टरवर्ड्स और आफ्टर बिकॉज समबडी इज शेयरिंग द स्क्रीन यस मैडम वो आपका सीवी और चेयर पर्सन का सीवी बताएंगे ना ओके when you will stop then i will uh, share yes yes you want to check first you want to check your slides madam yeah i is better if i check okay okay arjun please allow madam to share her slides uh, hi ma'am uh, yashoda ma'am you can share the screen now the okay. share screen option is at the bottom yes that has already done share screen and i can see my slides here so should i click, uh... click here no we cannot see your slides when i'm here nahi nahi i am saying that should i click uh please click on the uh, desktop window so after clicking on share screen you will get another window on on that on that window you can see uh, various options so you have to click the first option on the top left okay Mm -hmm. Hi yeah if you can see your see your screen now you can see my screen yes, now yes 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 should i do anything else or it is fine uh, it is fine but uh, the ppt okay now we can see your ppt properly okay mm -hmm. now has yes, sir joined what's the delay into this thing is there any delay no madam we'll just start dr khandelwal sir our chairperson is just joining okay because i have to go to after finishing this to another yes syllabus. yes we'll finish man man how do you manage your time you are such a busy person i am <laughs> not know i am in the uk with my daughter she had she has been blessed with a daughter and she has got a small son so and every day i see at least one flyer with your photo <laughs> <laughs> and with this in the uk it is 12 o'clock here it's going to be 12:30 oh okay you are in uk ma'am yes you care me <laughs> that is what i said my daughter is blessed with a granddaughter ah, okay she is also ah, having a yes sir bata raha hu main ha ha sir i am not telling everything 
now we are starting madam can we start now sir has joined yes so good evening and namaskar i warmly welcome our guest faculty dr yashodra pradeep ma'am from lucknow she is vice president elect foxy 2022 welcome madam i extend a hearty welcome to our senior physician of ratlam dr harish khandelwal sir to grace the meeting as chairperson welcome sir i invite and welcome seniors colleagues and delegates for today's scientific deliberation on liver disorders in pregnancy i would like to give a brief introduction of dr harish khandelwal sir though he is very well known needs no introduction dr khandelwal sir has done his md from mgm medical college indore he joined indian railway services and he retired got a voluntary retirement as senior medical officer uh, from western railways after 24 years of dedicated service since 2005 he is consultant in private various private hospitals he has chaired many seminars meetings at uh, api ima ratlam have been guest faculty at various cmes and conferences the main important thing is we obstetrician are really thankful to you sir he comes to our rescue uh, within minutes especially for our critically ill obstetric patients welcome sir now i hand over the uh, dais to dr neha saraf to invite our guest faculty and give her introduction it is my honor to introduce someone as great as dr yashodra pradeep ma'am first of all congratulations ma'am for being grandmother uh, congratulations ma'am thank you thank you dr yashodra ma'am is ex professor and head obgyn lucknow she is the ex senior professor kgmu president lucknow society vice president elect foxy vice president yeah, ims 2018 chairperson of family welfare committee she got best teacher award best paper award she is a reviewer in general of mid mid life health received various awards and honors from foxy psi and pfi she is a founder member of isopar pcos and lms and spart has variety of positions in psi pfi ims etc 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 various positions in ims chairperson credentials in menopause practitioners Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much for sparing time for our Ratlam Society. To start the session, I request our chairperson, Dr. Khandelwal sir, to start the session. सभी से नमः सभी से नमस्कार और मैं आप लोगों का कोई ज़्यादा टाइम नहीं लेते हुए पहले मैडम को सुनना पसंद करूँगा और मैं मैडम से रिक्वेस्ट करूँगा कि आप प्रेगनेंसी एंड लीवर डिसऑर्डर पे अपना टाक शुरू करें. Thank you so much, Dr. Harish. Mm. Uh, let me just find it out how to remove this pin. Yes, uh, but I want to see my this thing also. Uh, view option. Can you see me? Yes. Acha. Yep. Okay. Uh, uh, because I cannot see anything. The side gallery I could not see. I do not know why. So anyhow, uh, thank you so much for your kind words and Manisha for the invitation. Neha, for your kind words, and Dr. Harish, as I am really fortunate to uh, you are going to chair my session, which is uh, related to something medical disorders in pregnancy. And I ha just heard your CV. You are such a great person because you are available to the critical patients, and you know, obstetrician without physician cannot work. So that's a wonderful thing that you are here. So, and my. regards and respect to all the audience delegates which have been logged in and thank you so much for support me in my during my election of the vice president foxy so thank you so much i am sure that with the coming years we will be united more and more and i will be needing your help of you all so with this i am going to start the overview of liver disease in pregnancy and there is a management of icp in pregnancy will be little in detail uh so as i always say we always talk about the preeclampsia hypertensive disease of pregnancy which prevalence is 5% but you can see the liver disease uh, uh, incidence of prevalence is not less it is 3% uh, 
although in out of this 3%, quite a few is because of the preeclampsia also. So pregnancy is the most common cause of the liver dysfunction. It causes a significant maternal mortality and infant mortality and morbidity. Most important to know that liver disease is due to the pregnancy or pregnancy is in the existing liver disease because these two are wide apart. Uh, liver disease is due to pregnancy like hyperemesis gravidarum, like preeclampsia, like hype syndrome, like um, uh, acute fatty liver, the liver infarction. These are all because of the pregnancy. But the pregnancy can also occur in a woman who is already suffering with the liver disease, so, uh, like portal hypertension, cirrhosis, viral hepatitis, chronic hepatitis, or it could be coincidental. Uh, because uh, it is not uh, it is not pregnancy related, it is not chronically uh, present there or pre-existed, but it has happened during the pregnancy. Most common is the viral hepatitis, but can other be like autoimmune diseases and the Budd-Chiari syndrome, etc. The post-liver transplant is also a common thing these days because we are having organ transplant and liver transplant. Uh, is Madam, your slides are not visible. Yes. That's what oh, slides are not visible. No, no. Why? I think you have need not to share your slides again. Okay. Okay. Mm. So I should close probably everything. I'm not getting the close window. How to close it? Stop. Ma'am, please uh, press escape. Yes. yes. Uh, I just finished this. Share screen. Yes. And share. Now is it visible? No. Yes, ma'am, it is visible. It is visible. So why yes, ma'am. Uh, read the report. Why it is saying all this? How to close this window? It's something saying a leader in the 2020 Gartner Magic Quadrant for meeting solutions. I cannot see my own slides. This is not your slide, madam. This is not my slide. We can see the Zoom page. There must be a close option, na? close button. Uh, no, here there's no close no, option. Please allow me to uh, remote control your device. I'll do the needful. Okay. Ma'am, you need to share your screen again. You have only shared uh, Safari. You to, uh, again, click on share screen. Okay, share screen, yes. And uh, click on the top uh, left first option and then click here. First option is a blue board. Uh, what is the next uh, second after that? Yes, second is the this thing, attendee Desktop. Zoom. Okay. Post attendee Zoom. No, not even that option. You must be getting an option desktop one. Yes, desktop one is there. Yeah, please click on desktop one and then uh, click on share. Okay. Yes, now we can see your screen. But I, I can't see. Now, uh, please go to, uh, at the bottom. Uh, there's an icon P. At the bottom, P, WPX. No, I am getting this bar over it, which says you are sharing a screen live. Stop share. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. That is okay. So, just a moment. Uh, please give me remote control again. Okay, I have given you. Mm -hmm. Now I can see my screen. Yes. Can you see? Yes, we all we can also see your screen. 
acha okay then it is fine so now you can see yes yes okay thank you now i can see the gallery view also so mm -hmm. it's very good right is again saying leave and is it two windows to again share, share the screen you need to again share the screen oh my god please press escape and uh, share screen again escape in the mac is uh it's escape only yes share screen mm hmm uh desktop one desktop one yes and then share now it is visible. great yes we can see your screen now okay thank mm -hmm. you so it is just that uh, incidence of liver disease is 3% it is most common cause in the medical disorder and it is important to know whether this pregnancy is in the liver disease or it is a coincidental or it is because of the pregnancy i was saying there are three classes which is very important to know because the management will depend because if it is due to the pregnancy like hyperemesis uh, gravidarum intrahepatic cholestasis liver infarction the preeclampsia or is a hep syndrome or is a acute fatty liver or it could be because of the pregnancy has occurred in the pre existing liver disease like, like autoimmune disorders uh, primary cirrhosis there is a chronic portal hypertension and uh, viral hepatitis and other thing chronic hepatitis or it could be coincidental neither it is because of the pregnancy nor it was pre existing but it has happened during pregnancy like viral hepatitis but chiari syndrome etc etc so it is very important to know but what is the commonest sign which in the liver failure we have got a spider nevi but because of the physiological change in the pregnancy there is a 40% uh, increase in the cardiac output and 30% uh, in the plasma volume so it the most of the women will have spider nevi into this so a spider nevi is not the surest sign of the liver disease in the case of pregnancy so this is the classification which i have just narrated that it is hyperemesis intrahepatic and this and non pregnancy pre existing liver diseases and the coincidental with the pregnancy so coming to the first we will talk about the uh, this column this is the hyperemesis gravidum in intrahepatic i will come later the hypertension related uh, because the time is not much so i'll just cut short but i'll definitely do the important features liver infarction and acute fatty liver and then i will come to the non pregnancy related and then coincidentally pregnancy so it is hyperemesis we all know it is the first trimester most severe form of nausea and vomiting of pregnancy defined as intractable vomiting results in dehydration ketosis weight loss of greater than 5% because diagnosis is very important uh, we should not under diagnose we should not over diagnose so it is a weight loss of greater than 5% incidence is 0.3 to 2% of the all the pregnancies symptoms usually but not exclusively begin before 8 weeks of pregnancy the exact etiology of the hyperemesis gravidarum is not clear uh, there is a, but there is a positive correlation with the human corvinogonadotropin because we know that human corvinogonadotropin chain is also having the chain of the uh, thyrotropin tsh chain is also similar so it and it has been seen when there is a human corvinogonadotropin is more in cases of twin pregnancies and triplet pregnancies and because of molar pregnancy we get more of the hyperemesis gravidarum in this because it may also cause the thyrotoxicosis so we have to be a little careful and plus the ivf pregnancies because you load the patient with the progestogen and it is very important to have a human corvinogonadotropin also has been raised because they are most of the time is a multiple pregnancy plus you give from the extra out uh, out from out the lot of scg to these patients so it is not only this the scg it is also the psychological genetic cultural and hormonal causes could be there but none has been definitely proved so you have to individualize whether your patient is having which kind of the problem because psychological problems are also very common you have to go into the detail you have to uh, get into confidence into the woman only then the woman is going to say all these things so in hyperemesis gravidarum biochemical abnormalities are common renal dysfunction secondary to the dehydration occurs so we have to see that whether this if any woman who is coming with the vomiting and uh, nausea 
and with renal dysfunction this renal dysfunction is because yeah. of the previous existing renal dysfunction or it is happening because of the pre renal causes because of the dehydration so your parameters of the renal dysfunction will be different abnormalities the hepatic enzyme occurs in approximately 50% of the cases that require hospitalization a uh, pump treatment is essential as hyperemesis gravidarium accounts for approximately one maternal death per year in the uk so you can imagine if uk the country like uk is having one maternal death per year so how many we are having but we are not able to diagnose because the women come in such a late stage with multi organ failure we are not able to pinpoint it is because of the uh, hyperemesis gravidarium or because of the liver disease or because of the renal disease or because of whatever it is so it is very very important that you have to take a great a detailed history only then we may and sometimes these women are referred in such a grave condition that you hardly have any time and they just go away so you know, the management is very simple there's nothing great into it the iv hydration correction of hyponatremia and hypokalemia because it occurs because of the hyponatremia hypokalemia and hypomagnesia because of the intractable vomiting thrombo prophylaxis thymine antiemetic treatment and when she is controlled then only start the oral fluids and the semi solid and solid diet so uh, as i said vitamin b6 and vitamin b6 plus doxalamine is a very very safe drug very effective we are using since ages and there's we are nothing is uh, can replace these drugs but you have to give in the full dose to a woman before you start on the uh, iv therapy or something because the full dose is two tablet tds three times a day the phylactic dose is only two tablets at bedtime or sometimes we say bd but if she is not responding to it we have to give a full dose that is two tablets three times a day second line therapy can also be given when it is intractable dopamine antagonist that is metoclopramide or phenothiazines but in the refractory cases we can do give the steroid and glucocorticoids onto steroid is safe drug but it should not be started as a first line it should always be started with because it is not going to take care of the vitamin b6 so we have to first start with this give a full dose of it if it does not respond then you should go to the other drugs it is a reversible condition the best part is and there is no permanent hepatic damage occurs it reoccurs in the subsequent pregnancy the history is most important whenever the patient comes to you for the first time that uh, whether she had in the uh, uh, last pregnancy or not hepatic biochemical abnormalities are more marked or that fail to resolve on cessation of the vomiting should raise a suspicion of alternative cause the abnormal hepatic biochemistry so if this vomiting is not going to respond then you have to think of other causes also because by that time you have investigated you have seen that she is not having any liver failure or the pre existing liver disease or the renal diseases are also very common so uh, second the commonest cause of the liver dysfunction in pregnancy it is because of the pregnancy is hypertensive problems the pre eclampsia and the hype syndrome we all know what are the diagnostic criteria i again i am not going to go into the detail of it that 140 equal or more systolic blood pressure diastolic blood pressure equal or more than 90 is a diagnostic of preeclampsia it should occur 20 uh, after the 20 weeks of gestation in a woman with a previous normal blood pressure to diagnose because there is no moderate uh, p now it is mild or severe to diagnose a severe preeclampsia systolic blood pressure should be equal or more than 160 diastolic blood pressure equal or more than 110 it can be confirmed within a short interval of minutes because you don't have to take 4 hours apart as we do in the cases of mild preeclampsia it should be taken 4 hours apart but if we get a blood pressure 160 equal or more than 110 we should not wait for 4 hours within 15 minutes you have to repeat by the time you are arranging the things your max safe and everything you just repeat the your blood pressure or if you have got a monitor you can have the monitor on so uh, the other parameters which says it is a severe kind of the preeclampsia is the urine collection um, the albumin should be more than 300 mg or protein creatinine ratio should be <coughs> equal to more than 0.3 mg per dl or the dipstick is 2 plus 
<coughs> but as we know proteinuria is not the surest sign of the um, preeclampsia now it has not been removed from the surest sign of this so if <coughs> there is no proteinuria but we get a new onset hypertension in a woman who is 20 weeks or more <coughs> along with the thrombocytopenia renal insufficiency serum creatinine concentration in the absence of any other renal disease or impaired liver function in the uh, uh, type of elevated alt or ast pulmonary edema new onset headache unresponsive to medication and not and not account for any other alternative diagnosis or visual symptoms so if you get any other symptom along with the raised blood pressure it is uh, 160 and 100 and 10 it is the severe pe we are not supposed to if the protein is missing we don't have to think that it is not a severe pe so uh, the help you know it is a common thing which occurs in the pregnancy nearly 40 uh, 20 to 30% of the women who is having a preeclampsia can suffer with the help syndrome help is a hemolysis with the micro angiopathic uh, blood smear he and l for elevated enzymes and lp is for the low platelet counts all three features are present then it is a complete help if any one or two is present it is a partial help syndrome so incidence of help syndrome as i have said overall less than 1% but in case of severe preeclampsia it could go to 10 to 20% of the pregnancies we do not have all these reports so uh, maybe we are having more than this what is important if you want to diagnose a hype syndrome we have got two important uh, classifications sibai we know the hypertensive disease of pregnancy the sibai has worked hard for it and all the parameters all the guidelines have been made only by the sibai so is it known as tennessee classification because he lives there so hemolysis uh, is hemolysis is seen by seeing at the cystocytosis of the elevated serum bilirubin more than 1.2 mg per dl or the elevated enzymes ast more than 70 and ldh more than 600 ldh is a very important thing in all cases of hemolysis you see that ldh is been raised so if you get a ldh again more than 600 you know that it is a severe pe and it is a help syndrome low platelet count is less than 100 and 1 lakh per cubic millimeter square per cubic millimeter there is another classification there is a mississippi classification comes which has put more emphasis only on the platelet you can see the class 1 the severe form in which the platelet is less than 50000 ast alt is more than or equal to 70 and ldh is more than or equal to 600 class 2 you see that uh, this is these two are common but the platelets are more than 50000 and class 3 the platelets are more and the ald and ldh is the same so ldh is a very important marker in cases of diagnosing the severity of the pe and we must always look into it so complete versus partial as i have said if all three criteria are present it is a complete if any one or two is present it is a partial hype syndrome so differential diagnosis is very important because when when we see we know that this patient is this but as i said she could be suffering from the other disease and we have seen all or uh, we have come across during our um, clinical setting we have seen all patients that we could thought that it is a preeclampsia but she was acute fatty liver of pregnancy and we lost the patient because it has got a very bad prognosis and these patients also come late and we also take some time because of the lack of history or something like that the hemolytic uremic syndrome is also very important we have got a patient once she was very bad severely anemic and all those things uh, there's a help we diagnose and the uh, we could save the woman but we could we lost the child and she had multiple losses also but the next pregnancy when she came then when i saw the discharge card i said you were very sick yes ma'am i was very sick i came to you but uh, uh, any how my child could not be saved but i was saved so this time i have come idea so she was in fact before 20 weeks of pregnancy so we thought that uh, is she, how she could be pe and severe pe and again she was very anemic she had in the previous time also 8 or 10 units of the blood so we uh, were just managing again but she deteriorated so fast we could not save her again but at least we could 
make the diagnosis of hemolytic uremic syndrome she was suffering with. TTP is also very common. SLE acute exacerbations have been associated and may present like a HEP syndrome. So these are the non uh, non PE causes of the HEP syndrome is also there: viral hepatitis, hepatic encephalopathy, and pyelonephritis. Because sepsis can also cause the liver failure. But the surgical causes can also be there. Gallbladder disease, we all know in the pregnancy, gallbladder disease is much more in comparison to the non-pregnant woman and an appendicitis co coincidental can happen to anybody. So management of the help and PEs, both antepartum, interpartum and postpartum. The, the SEOG 2003 task force says that corticosteroids for thrombocytopenia should not be given. It should be given only to improve the lung function because they do not have any effect on the uh, health, over the health syndrome. Uh, pregnancy related liver disease, as I said, is again, uh, we have covered two. Now, next is uh, acute fatty liver of the pregnancy. Is a very vast, I will just focus on, there is a Swan C criteria. And you can see in this criteria, if it is six or more features are present, we should suspect it is uh, acute fatty liver of the pregnancy. And when you go through the list, you see the simple symptoms, vomiting, abdominal pain, polydipsia, polyuria, uh, elevated uh, leukocytosis, elevated uric acids. So these are very important. Yet they make four, abdom vomiting, abdominal pain, polydipsia, polyuria, and leukocytosis. So if these four are present, you have to just look for two. So when you investigate, if you find any two of these uh, from the long list, the hypoglycemia is a very, very important feature of the acute fatty liver. And you get a blood sugar less than 4 millimole per liter. It is uh, less than 70, uh, less than 60, in fact. And um, ascites or bright liver, if you do ultrasonography, elevated transaminase, see, not very much. Uh, renal impairment, coagulopathies could be there. And microvesicular steatosis on the biopsy can be seen. So, and these patients deteriorate very fast. So, unless we have made a diagnosis, early diagnosis is being done, only then we can say, in fact, uh, I because I am doing this uh, in various societies, and in Navi Mumbai, in the Apollo, they are having there's one hepatologist was there. So, when the obstetrician, because it is a multi specialty team who can only treat these uh, patients. So they said they prepared a woman for the even liver transplant in the AFL, AFL, AFLP. So uh, now this woman is a young woman. She will come to you after uh, post liver transplant pregnancy also. So we have to be very, very careful in taking the history and examination. So now coming to the second part, the pregnancy and pre-existing liver disease. Uh, it could be chronic liver diseases, viral hepatitis, cirrhosis, and portal hypertension, post-liver transplant, and autoimmune. Why I'm saying this? Because this, why uh, I have focused on this uh, liver diseases, which was not very much talked about. I do not see much CMEs on this. Recently, I started seeing, because I am doing it for last one year, now I started seeing that quite a few people are speaking on it. So Because I had experience of in uh, two months' time, I got three patients who had multiple losses of the pregnancy. And they from CSC, they went to the institutes, big institutes. But the cause could not, they came with the more, big, big, uh, thick files. So I do not know what to do. So I thought, let's do a, because the missing thing was only whole abdominal ultrasound. So I said, write a whole abdominal ultrasound. And you will not believe this is the only investigation which has made the diagnosis of chronic liver disease. It was hepatosplenomegaly. It was the portal signs of portal hypertension on the ultrasound was there. And it has opened the whole book that this losses are because of this. And she was anemic also like seven gram or something hemoglobin was there. This anemia is also because of this. So this is only thing because we could make the diagnosis. I was in the institute. So I could send it to the hepatologist, the GIE physician, and that person has given us some window, although he said that I cannot do much more at the moment, only once she has delivered, only then I can do. Although the endoscopy is possible in the pregnant woman to see the esophageal viruses because portal hypertension has got the very important sequelae of uh, esophageal viruses and most of the women die because of this. 
So complications of the chronic liver diseases are, as I said, that I got a woman uh, who had the and her the basic uh, the good part or what has made me to think over it because her losses were in the de in the decreasing order. The first loss she had at eight and a half months is stable. Then she had seven months. Then she had six months, and then she had it five months. So this I could not explain why this was happening like this, because her disease was increasing, because her hepatic functions are getting worse. So her pregnancy could not continue, which continued for the first. So unless you diagnose, because each pregnancy is a load for the woman uh, on the liver. Because you get so much uh, estrogen, progesterone into it, and most of the time when you see a B uh, BOH patient, you start with so much of hormones also. So this all have was deteriorating her liver functions, and growth restricted fetus stillbirths. So she had a stillbirth, she had preterm births, she had abortions. All sort of the things were there, and it's not one, the two, three patients were there. Maybe because I treated one, so people have brought more. Maybe this is a possibility. So what are the maternal effects? I just uh, emphasized that it is a worsening of the liver synthetic function, hepatic decomposition, development of fasciitis, variceal hemorrhages, encephalopathy, and it has been increased fetal and maternal morbidity and infant mortality. So I said commonest cause is hemorrhage and uh, mortality is very high. This is a Western figure. So I am quoting here, we do not have these figures is 10.6 to 1.6 because they can make an early diagnosis. We make a diagnosis very late. So our mortality is very high. Uh, this is also not important to you that uh, prognostic scoring markers, MELD and UKLD, this is for whether this woman, when she comes to you with the pre-existing liver disease in pregnancy, with pregnancy, you have to score it and see whether it is going to decompensate in this pregnancy or she doesn't have to decompensate. So you can send it to the GI physician and they can do everything. So it is just for knowing that at least you should know there is some scores are there and the score is more than less than six, the incidence of decompensation is rare, but if it is more than 10, the decompensation is uh, there. So you have to think it off whether you should terminate or continue the pregnancy. Viral hepatitis, as I said, hepatitis A, B and E, Hypes simplex hepatitis, and along with it, the cytomegalo, Epstein Barr, and adenoviruses hepatitis are also common. Cytomegalo, less people know, but it is very, very common, and we all know the cytomegalo virus. When you see, you do a torch, you see cytomegalo is almost present in all women is a, a chronic uh, cytomegalo virus infection, not acute cyto uh, chronic infections are there. Uh, I'm very uh, interested in cytomegalo because this was my thesis long back, 30 years back when I have done this thesis on the cytomegalovirus and this thing I've seen in the breast milk and the uh, secretions and what not. And at that time, I read all those viral um, medicines, which is now, uh, it, it was only on the pipeline, these medicines, azuvidine and other things. Now they all are, we are using it for the viral hepatitis. So what I have to, just this chart is there. And this chart says we have to know how it happens during the pregnancy. Um, reference range, if you see the SGPT in the non-pregnant is 0 to 40 is a normal. And it decreases in during the pregnancy. So if it is increasing, that means it is abnormal. Similarly, the AST, you see it is slightly decreases in the trimester. The serum uh, bilirubin also decreases in the uh, uh, pregnancy from the non-pregnant level. The uh, glutamyl transferase also decreases. Only there is alkaline phosphatase because there is a fetal alkaline phosphatase is also there. So it's the only thing which increases in the liver dysfunction. When you do a liver uh, test, liver function test, you see that all are will, will be decreased from the non-pregnant level and it will only be increasing. The albumin globulin ratio decreases because, and this all happens because of the uh, hemodilution. But alkaline phosphate, despite that increases because there is an addition of the fetal alkaline phosphatase also. 
the bile acids are non pregnant and the pregnant in the third trimester up to 14 is been taken normal the hemoglobin decreases into second trimester then increases and the platelet also going to uh, remain the same pregnancy and the non pregnant level but if it decreases that means it is something abnormal and how you can these investigation can fit and you think it of which kind of the diagnosis could be differential diagnosis you can put in if there is a alt and total bile acids are increasing but only 1.5 to 15 fold uh total bilirubin is usually normal it is a intrahepatic cholestasis because it is total bile acids increased to 15 fold the maximum increase at may occur in 17% of the cases if you are not getting this intrahepatic cholestasis or it is not the clinical signs and symptoms is not support then you have to go to the additional and the differential diagnosis it could be anti mitochondrial anti smooth muscles the autoimmune diseases are there if there is only increase in alt the bile acids are normal the bilirubin is normal is a preeclampsia in which the alt increases 2 to 5 fold so this is the initially in the preeclampsia when it is going so i said that maybe the blood pressure is 140 90 but if you get this you understand that this woman is okay because we do not because there is a one definition of the um, hypertension in pregnancy or the preeclampsia is uh, rise 30% systolic and 15 of diastolic and we do not have their blood pressure which was pre pregnancy blood pressure so it could be because she is having more than that she may be a case of because the many women uh, we see that they are having normal blood pressure of 90 by 60 so if she is coming with the 120 and 90 or 140 90 you can think it of it as a severe kind of this thing so increase in blood pressure urine analysis creatinine platelets so because we do not know we comment that definition but we are have to keep in mind that this may be a possibility so whenever there is a signs of preeclampsia there the increase in blood pressure is there and alt is increased only to 2 to 5 fold we should take it seriously because it is going to be the preeclampsia the hepatic impairment and that is a severe preeclampsia maybe the blood pressure is only 140 90 if the alt increases 2 to 30 fold total bile acids are normal serum bilirubin is going to increase then it is going to be the help syndrome because the bilirubin increases because of the hemolysis and the ldh also increases because of the hemolysis if the alt is increasing and total bilirubin is but bilirubin total bilirubin is increasing 4 to 15 fold that is it is increasing too fast then it is acute fatty liver it is not only this it as i said it could be differential diagnosis of this but if it gets the picture of leukocytosis you get the picture of uh, you know, hypoglycemia and other things associated with it we should think it of the um, acute fatty liver of the pregnancy so diagnosis as i said chronic hypertension is been associated with the varices we are not going to manage it but we just have to keep in mind that if we are seeing portal hypertension we are doing a whole abdominal ultrasound hepatos you know megalian signs of portal hypertension are there we have to refer her and we can also ask for the endoscopy because endoscopy in the second trimester is safe or only uh, some risk of fetal hypoxia is always there because you do it in the sedation and standing and in, in the sitting position but uh, uh, so most of the uh, endoscopists are not very interested in doing this but if we should pursue it because if something happens to this because the gravity of the disease we can only say that whether we should continue although the termination of pregnancy is also not safe when once the woman is having the esophageal varices so but at least we can uh, uh, counsel the person that you have brought your woman into the situation when you have got the like this the seesaw type type of the situation so uh, so to rule out because we have seen the people are not very interested in doing endoscopy there is another um, uh, another guidelines are coming uh, platelet counts and the uh, presence of the varices so this is not very very practiced it is still in the pipeline 
it has been seen it has got a 78% sensitivity and 89% of the specificity. So maybe in the coming times, we don't have to do the invasive procedure, only by this we have to do this. So management in the uh, is same as in the non-pregnant position, in non-pregnant patients, you have to stabilize the woman and then uh, you do, uh, maybe she requires endoscopic therapy or she may require a conservative therapy. It depends upon this thing. Beta blocker can be given as a therapy, banding or sclerosing, avoid vasopressin or synthetic analog. This is all the part of the hepatologist. We are not going to do all this. Uh, current evidence is somatostatin and it's just uh, uh, you should know that that is all. Otherwise, we are not going to do all this thing. But insertion of the uh, protosystemic shunts, emergency sizes therapy when endoscopic techniques have failed is important to save the life of the woman. So it has been seen if there is a pre-existing load, there is 25% risk of the uh, um, uh, very serious hemorrhage is there and the, uh, it has been associated with the mortality of the woman. So mortality rates are as high as 50% have been reported if the vevices are present. So it is always good if we get a woman with this because I got two women, I send it to the hepatologist. They said this is, uh, they did not agree to do a endoscopy because you know public hospitals are as it is very much overloaded and you hardly get one or two physicians into the department. So, and they are, they are not able to cope with their work. So they do not, uh, they do not feel very encouraged about it. So we did not, we could not know about it, but we have just kept our fingers crossed and with the uh, ultrasound only, we could manage and see, and we could give the live baby to this woman and we save the life of the woman also. So I said intrahepatic cholestasis, I'll deal with in such in little detail because of uh, this is going to be common condition. is a commonest pregnancy specific liver disease. It is a reversible form of cholestasis characterized by elevated fasting or postprandial serum bile acids, a spontaneous relief of the signs and symptoms within six weeks of the delivery. If it does not occur within six weeks, we know that this is something which is again having some differential diagnosis. We have to go back and see what is the cause. And it also recurs like the hyperemesis gravidarum in the next pregnancy. So I just, I have put a clinical case, G, uh, uh, this is uh, Ms. Mrs. G, 30 years, primary gravida, first antenatal visit at 12 weeks, and she was doing fine. But at 32 weeks, she comes with a complaint of poor sleep and associated with itching in the body parts and complaints of pale stools, appetite is normal. So on examination, we do not see any pillow or any actress, no pedal edema, as we know that it doesn't increase more of the serum bilirubin. Abdomen and the skin lesions, renal excoriations, papillary eruptions are uh, not there. You have to check uh, the abdomen for the skin lesions and no rash is there. Obstetrician examination is within normal limit. So when she comes with the pruritus, we have to just see what are the common causes of the pruritus. So there's a differential diagnosis is intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy is one. The atopic eruptions of the pregnancy is two. Femphigoid gestation, 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 uh, uh, pruritic urticaria papules and plaques of the pregnancy, viral hepatitis, chronic active hepatitis, and primary biliary cirrhosis. These four are because of the liver disorders. And this, But you see the eruptions are only when it is going to be the either AEP or the femphigoid gestations or the pruritic urticaria papules and plaques of the pregnancy. So if the eruptions are there, we know that it is chance of the intrahepatic cholestasis is less. I'm not going to deal with all these three. It is just, we should think it of that this could also be the diagnosis. Uh, so management is history. As I always say, history is a very, very important thing. Uh, the ICP is always onset with the pruritus. It may be sudden or insidious. It starts usually from the soul and palms, but becomes generalized. Uniform throughout the day, but worsens at the night. So she's having poor sleep. Anorexia, vomiting, and nausea may be present, may not be present. Color of the urine and stool, stool is important because, because the cholestasis, there is a pale uh, stools are there and the colored urine may also be there. Any specific medication because people take so many Ayurvedic medicines also, especially those who are having the infertility or conceived with the ART or something like that. 
so we have to think that they are not taking any medicine which is hepatotoxic so send some simple investigation cbc lft viral screen routine antenatal investigation ultrasound abdomen and asked her to return with the reports so we have seen everything was normal only sgot is increased sgpt is increased and the serum bile acids as i have already shown in the chart it should be not more than 14 micromole per liter here it is 20 so it is increased and this goes in favor of the intrahepatic cholestasis dipstick protein is as i said that because it has got a lot of uh, differential diagnosis so you have to see by checking the protein and um, uh, viral screen you know that we are not dealing with the uh, chronic hepatitis or we are not dealing with the any of the um, uh, preeclampsia although protein is not a very sure sign but you can see other things also other tests also so incidence of icp is 3 to 5% of the pregnant women icp typically presents in the third trimester more common in the multiple pregnancy and in those who have received the fertility treatment it has got a complex etiology which is more of a genetic in nature again i am going to next few slides although you just have to know that it has got a genetic uh, predisposition and it has been unmasked in the women because of the elevated estrogen progesterone metabolite in pregnancy so this is unmasked in a woman who is genetically susceptible for the icp so clinical presentation we have already said pruritus which worsens in the night starts from palm and sole no excoriations no eruptions excoriations are there because of the itching and dark urine periphysis could also be there and it resolves after 6 weeks and it can we occur in the next pregnancy so diagnosis has been made only by the liver acids bile acids not by the bile salts the um, liver enzymes ast and alt so it is a european association the study says that it is guidelines recommended that you diagnose icp with uh, biliary acid bile acids not by the uh, salts uh, the liver enzymes exclusion of other potential etiologies are very important i always believe in uh, keeping the differential diagnosis in mind and ruling out those approximately 15% of the cases have genetic variations in one of the hepatocannabinoid transport proteins and serum bilirubin is really raised so this is a genetic thing you can have the variation in abcb11 that's a bile salt export pump or the abcb4 the phosphatidyl choline phenyl base or the smallest studies have reported that it could be the genetic variation in the abcc2 the conjugated organic nn transport or it is the atp 8b1 fic1 nuclear bile acid receptor you don't have to learn all this you just have to keep in mind that it may be having a genetic predisposition why i am saying this because hepatobiliary disorder in pregnancy is a big big uh chapter and big thing with so many diseases there in fact the pancreatic uh, pancreatitis i have seen in the post cesarean case it was acute pancreatitis and only it is was because of the intrahepatic cholestasis which was there so it was only the biliary uh, biliary uh, ash was there and which was causing the acute pancreatitis and we saved just because we, that woman because we could diagnose her because treatment is not much only thing you diagnosis is very important so it has been seen that um, and G, uh, ggt levels are, are also important because you see if this genetic uh, variation is there it may be elevated but if these are the problems then it ggt levels are less so ggt levels low does not say that it does not have a icp it is high it does not say it is a icp it is high yes it is a icp but low levels also would be because of something else perinatal outcome we know that it has been associated with adverse uh, perinatal outcome preterm labor stay birth and admission to the neonatal unit because the bile salts bile enzymes are bile acids are toxic to the cardiotoxic uh complications are i said that uh, up to 10 or 14 is been taken normal critical level is uh, less than 40 so between 10 or 14 to 40 you should never cross the 40 so you should when you diagnose icp because the bile acids are increased more than 14 then you do it weekly and uh, weekly checks you do and then see how it is rising or how it is 
uh, falling and you plan your termination of pregnancy accordingly because it is a third trimester disease so it always happens after 32 weeks of the pregnancy so you get some time and uh, time window to get, get the lung maturity and counsel the woman and do the things so once the cholestasis has been diagnosed we have to keep the regular lft checks general review bp measurement because could be associated with the other uh, pregnancy associated liver dysfunction we pre eclampsia is the very common so we have to keep the checks and allow the monitoring of the condition exclusion of the other diagnosis coagulation screen because we have still not ruled out so we have to do a coagulation screen and in case there is a rapid excavation lft may need admission consider the additional diagnosis treatment of providers in the form of antihistamine and the calamine can be given every time whenever the woman is coming the providers please take it seriously and follow with the bile acids every week Uh, the daily fetal movement count is also an important thing to keep your observation on the fetal status so first line treatment is very simple that's say also deoxycholic acid which enhances the bilirubin transport of the bile acids and it is anti apoptotic how does it work it is anti apoptotic it improves the excretion of pruritogens like progesterone sulfate because i said estrogen progesterone is very high and their metabolite progesterone sulfate is in this thing uh, so it causes the and this causes the pruritus so once you start with also deoxycholic acid it enhances its excretion and that is how it improves the uh, pruritus it enhances the transplacenta transport of bile acids from the fetus to the mother and that is how it reduces the placenta damage and the uh, fetal damage also it has been seen there is a 75% improvement in the symptoms and perinatal outcome but once also deoxycholic is started it should be continued till the uh, till delivery and it should be given in the full doses so meta analysis and in vitro experiments suggest that it use positively impact on the preterm labor neonatal admission placental damage and fetal arrhythmias sometimes this also deoxycholic acid is not working then we can combine it with the rifampicin because it is a x receptor and uh, uh, agonist and it is a potent pregnant x receptor agonist so that is how it improves the excretion of this pregnant or the progesterone metabolites and it has got a synergistic action with the udca uh, there are other drugs which can also be given but they are not much used s adenosyl methionine enhances the phospholipid excretions dexamethasone as i have already said it has got no impact it has only been given for the lung maturity uh there is small uh, this thing uh, studies are there which says the charcoal may improve and there is a goa gum this was very important uh, this is something which is i opened up to me while i was preparing this talk this is a goa phali i do not know what you call whether it is available in the ratlam or not but definitely the up it is available and anyhow i am very fond of this goa phali and we cook quite often in the season when this comes so this is has been associated with the reduced pruritus so anybody can say that what should i eat you can say that you can add the uh, goa phali gobu gangam into the your diet or the activated charcoal colistramine is also an important drug but it uh, decreases the luminal absorption of the uh, deoxycholic acid and the vitamin k and we all know the vitamin k is very important for the coagulation so it increases the chances of pph and the neonatal hemorrhage if it is not been um, cholestramine is been given without addition of the vitamin k so uh, the full dose of the uh, also deoxycholic acid is nearly 15 mg per kg body weight per day or it is 300 mg tds topical calamine lotion and other things is is been advised to her and she returns at 37 weeks with the serum bilirubin with the bile acids are 35 micromoles which is not near to the range of this and she has completed 37 weeks although the uh, nst is reactive the fetal movements are good but we know that it is not going to be because next week she may have in the critical level and we may lose the adverse uh, we may get a adverse perinatal outcome so we have to admit this woman do a other test do a fetal monitoring and counsel her about the fetal risk and plan for the delivery because of the adverse risk and the poor outcome because the poor outcome cannot be predicted it is just like a gdm there is a sudden silent iud occurs 
So and as we see that uh, while assets are increasing, so we have to be very, very cautious. It has been seen timing of the delivery and mode of delivery, the word about on it. That's the elective deliveries around 36 to 36, eight weeks has should be recommended as ST bus tend to cluster around the 37 to 39 weeks. A discussion with women regarding the induction of labor, 37 plus weeks should be there. Women should be informed because we are not able to predict. So it is better to take out the baby and use the labor, depending upon the bishop score and other things that should also be there. And should be informed, uh, the adverse outcome may be stronger and more severe in comparison. Uh, it should be informed that the case for intervention is more than 37 weeks uh, because we have got a stronger evidence that biochemical abnormalities of the bile acids are being associated with the um, uh, associated with the adverse perinatal outcome. The American College of 2016 gastroenterologists have said because of the increased risk of fetal complication, the ICP early delivery at 37 weeks is recommended, and this is a strong recommendation. The postnatal care, as I said, because it has to come back to normal, so postnatal care is also very important. And please mind that all liver, this, liver uh, functions, they deteriorate after the delivery because there's a lot of estrogen and progesterone is going into the circulation, which is going to be excreted, especially in the cases of who is having the pre-existing liver disease or the hype syndrome. So it is very important, the follow-up of the postnatal care in case of the liver disease, uh, uh, whether it is pre-existing or it is a uh, coincidental or it is a uh, associated with the pregnancy. So LFT always deteriorates after the pregnancy is being terminated. Uh, so it should be repeated within 48 hours and after 10 days and see whether it has come back to normal or not. Uh, increased incidence of obstetric cholesterol in family members, uh, if it is there, it has got a high chance of um, high chance of uh, recurrence in the family members. So management, as we have already done, that she should be terminated and uh, the post of postnatal uh, period, she should have the biochemical hepatic impairment should be done, should be seen after three months postpartum to see that she has come back to normal or not. If we have not come back to normal, maybe we have to think of some other diagnosis. So as we know that ICP has got a recurrence rate in the subsequent pregnancy, gallstones are common. In the later life, risk factor is ABCB4 gene. Within five years, the gallstones in the pregnant woman uh, in the, who had the ICP is quite common. Hepatobiliary malignancy it is also something which is I did not know that those women who have ICP, they're also prone for, or they may have a higher chance of hepatobiliary malignancies. It has been seen that hepatitis C infection is also more prevalent in the woman who has got ICP. There's some genetic variations are there. So I do not know what is the exact cause of it and I do not know, I, I cannot elaborate upon it. So infection women with ICP or YC website remains unclear. Whether it is because the hepatitis C, the ICP has occurred or the ICP is uh, because of the ICP, the hepatitis C has occurred. So what is the take home message is, is the commonest pregnancy specific liver disease, pruritus without rash is presenting symptom. Serum bile acids are increased associated with adverse outcome, spontaneous relief within six weeks of the pregnancy, high recurrence rate in subsequent pregnancies, also deoxycholic acid is the first line of treatment. This is the few charts which I just want to share with you that it is uh, American College of Gastroenterology said that liver disease in uh, the hyperemesis occurs in the first trimester. The cholestasis occurs in the third trimester. The help and acute fatty liver is also occurs in the second half of the pregnancy. This is in the early second half cholestasis or in the late second half in both it could be there. But help and PE and the acute fatty liver is always in the second half, late second half of the pregnancy or the third trimester. Patients with acute fatty liver of the pregnancy have two hepatic dysfunction and may or may not have signs of preeclampsia and the health syndrome. So if they have got, as I've said, so and C criteria, if you get those criteria that she fits in, you should think of acute fatty liver, refer her to the hepatologist or a gastrophysician or something, whosoever is present there to have the proper management. Consider viral or drug-induced hepatitis, gallstone disease, malignancy, the differential diagnosis of abnormal liver test. 
in any trimester if any in the uh, liver dysfunction comes in any trimester of the pregnancy you can think of all these diseases chronic hepatitis b or c poses a risk of transmission to the offspring so you have to take care of the offspring and prevent the vertical transmission so we have already gone through this chart that only alkaline phosphatase increases and albumin protein decreases and the rest all are slightly in uh, decreases in the pregnancy uh, they remain unaffected or slightly decrease as we have seen normal is 40 and 32 and 36 it remains that alt and ast both from in time and serum cholesterol so what is important is that history is very important if you get a history of pruritus or the hyperemesis in the previous pregnancy the nausea vomiting polyuria polydipsia drug travel exposure of viral hepatitis history of gallstones see that in which trimester she is and then you can have some window of opportunity to diagnose her early physical examination is very important protein urea and liver examination very important because in the late pregnancy you are not able to palpate the liver you are not able to percuss it or nowadays we are having the facility for the ultrasound so probably i have seen that percussion is now <laughs> hardly people do it uh, so because uh, the liver is dull or shunken it could be both depending upon the type of the cirrhosis and the stage of the cirrhosis the blood test is routine liver function test including the prothrombin time is important uh, we have to rule out the associated renal dysfunction and the serology for the viral hepatitis and test for hepatitis e because we know that hepatitis e is very very prominent in the pregnancy and we women may die of it the serum bilases as we have already emphasized that it is icp diagnostic for the icp urine analysis and culture to rule out the pyelonephritis as we have said that in the differential diagnosis pyelonephritis is one of the cause to cause the um, uh, uh, give you the differential diagnosis ultrasonography as i we have already emphasized monitor evaluation symptoms and liver function test before and after the delivery so pregnancy in the woman with the liver disease is rare however this is is not that rare however this is a clinically important group of the patients due to increased morbidity and mortality the spectrum of disease and presentation varies usually resulting in the delay in the diagnosis and the appropriate management the disorders are complex patient benefit if you get a multidisciplinary team the experienced physician or the specialist centers if present they are going to be much more help you it is important to ensure that women of child bearing age have contraceptive advice that takes their liver disease into consideration so whenever this woman is going for the contraception you have to take into account your uh, liver disease and i will show you because i am the one who has been chairperson of foxy for family welfare contraception is must in these women because the i as i said that multiple pregnancies are going to deteriorate the liver functions so but which has to be given i'll just come across in the last, next slides once women with a liver disease become pregnant it's essential to refer her to the specialist so they can manage that part and you can manage the pregnancy so the combined effort is going to help the woman and coming uh, with the good fetal maternal outcome preconception is risk stratification disease mechanism and therapeutic options should be known and uh, told to the woman and their relatives so liver dysfunction as i have already said maybe due to pregnancy or maybe it is exacerbation due to the pre existing disease it carries high mortality cirrhotic women can become pregnant although it is less common because the fertility the uh, infertility is common because of the high estrogen in cases of the chronic liver dysfunction this causes the amenorrhea and ovulation uh, um, ovulation failure but it could occur also Uh, common immunosuppressive agents if she is uh, the case who has got autoimmune diseases or who is been post transplant they should be continued as a thioprim and tacrolimus and cyclosporine they should not be stopped they should be continued contraception as i have already said i just want to because of the time constraint i have to go to other places so i just want to show you that see these are the options this is the mec criteria you can give it as a mild you can give any type of the contraception to this woman and save this woman going to the multiple pregnancy 
and deterioration in the liver disease. If it is severe or decompensated, still you can give copper IUCD. It does not going to cause or deteriorate the disease, but others are three and four criteria. If there's a history of cholestasis, pregnancy related, uh, the only COC which should not be given, rest any of the medicines, any of the contraception can be given. If it is past COC related, Again, because it is, uh, she has taken the COC and cholestasis was uh, because of the COC. Again, you cannot give the uh, this thing. You cannot give the hormonal contraceptive. Also, uh, you can give it as a only NEC criteria too. But copper tea can be given to all the women who are having any kind of the liver disease. So uh, uh, whether it is viral hepatitis, whether it is a gallstone, whether it is a surgical disease, maternal disease. So uh, I say my thanks to all and say that contraception, if you have saved the woman with uh, some kind of the disease and you want this woman to prevent, not to go into the deteriorate her liver dysfunction, you do not want, the contraception is must because they are these women are very high risk pregnancies. So my sincere thanks for you, Manisha, especially you have invited me and to Dr. Neha and Dr. Khandeywal, and to all the audience, please, we can discuss here at the moment, or you, if you have got any queries, you can give it to me in um, uh, this thing, yashodhra27 gmail.com, or you can WhatsApp me, I'll be, because feedbacks are very important, they help me to improve my presentation also. So I'm very much interested into it. So may I stop my, uh, share my screen? Yes, ma'am, you can. Okay. So this is all I have to say. Right. That, that was a very relevant disease in pregnancy. I would request our chairperson, Dr. Khandelwal, sir, to please conclude the session. First of all, I owe my thanks to uh, Dr. Yashodra, ma'am. Uh, she has enlightened me on very, uh, various aspects of uh, liver disease and pregnancy. And so nicely in given time, you have uh, covered all the aspects. Uh, one question which I want to ask from uh, Madam Yashodra. Yes. He, with yes, IVF please. candidates, with IVF pregnancies, uh, is there increase in the liver disorder? Because a lot many hormones have been used during this Yes, process. yes, that is what I said. The Especially the intrahepatic cholestasis is very common. Because we have seen this has got a genetic variation. And we load the woman with the progestogens and the, uh, this thing. So their metabolites are going to go back into the, uh, going to be excreted by this thing. So if there's any of the genetic which has been associated with the uh, export, uh, this thing, biliary export pump, or it has been associated with uh, some other gene, they are going to cause a problem. So they will not be able to be excreted and they will cause the pruritus. So we have to, this is common, the incidence is ICP is much more in the uh, IVF pregnancies or the assisted reproductive technique pregnancies in comparison to the normal spontaneous pregnancies, just because we are giving so many hormones and we do not know which woman is a genetically predisposed for the intrahepatic cholestasis. Yes, please. And I want to share one uh, basic information. Uh, yes. Because uh, in routine laboratory tests, by salt, we never order uh, to anyone, but uh, I have seen uh, patients uh, routine urine examination. If shows presence of bile salt, bile pigment are not present. It is an indicator that total bile uh, salt load in the patient is high. And yes, in pregnancy, as you have already told, SGPT, SGOT, they are because of hemodilution. They are not uh, going to rise very soon. They rise late. So presence of bile salt in urine without presence of bile pigment is a sign that this lady may be harboring towards liver disorder in pregnancy. Yes. And bile acids, we should now make a routine of doing the bile acids to diagnose ICP and uh, see the adverse perinatal outcome. So because uh, I'm sure once we start asking all the laboratories are there, so they all bring those tests. Now the tests are not going to be problem because we see that so many labs are working and the reports are coming from anywhere. Uh, the technology is there. So, uh, again, I owe my thanks. And my thanks are due to Dr. Manisha and Dr. Neha Shraf.
for giving me the opportunity to share such a nice session uh, given by dr yashodra madam thanks so thank you so much thank you madam for such an extensive elaborative talk dealing with every aspect of liver disease and their management and i hope you, i did not no 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 man very nice thing. inputs madam thank you so much and it is Because very true become, yeah this has become very close to my heart this uh, topic mm -hmm. is because i got the patients and who had multiple losses mm -hmm. and nobody could pinpoint they have done so much uh, sle i when i saw the this big fat files i did not know how to help this woman mm -hmm. and see the solution came with a simple test one is cbc she was uh, severely anemic hemoglobin mm -hmm. was 5 or 6 mm -hmm. and she was having hepatosplenomegaly and the portal hypertension and just because we have oriented so we have not loaded her with any hormone or anything we have been very quiet yes hepatologist was there to help us but he did not uh, he, he could not do much he said that send me the patient after that and we have terminated the pregnancy as soon as we started getting the uh, growth restriction so probably at 36 or 34 and 36 weeks parameters are seen so we just terminated the pregnancy 36 weeks mm -hmm. and we could give the live baby and i still remember that patient bled a lot because she was also having the thrombocytopenia because the liver disease pre existing liver disease she had thrombocytopenia also so and you can't do much you have to give only platelet transfusion and other things dr neha go ahead with vote of thanks please because yashodra ma'am is short of time so uh... we'll post the queries to your mail ma'am okay have... no problem uh, we still can have some questions uh, on half of levels yes I... and i've been to ratlam let the covid be over i would like love to come to ratlam i've been welcome madam welcome madam it will be an honor to us madam ratlam save are very famous Ah, yes. yes. Save gold. Very spicy, very tasty, very tasty, and very spicy. <laughs> and so many varieties of the uh, save from Ratlam are there. Lassun save and what not? I don't remember, but I've been uh, because Gujarat is my this thing, and you go on the way when you get a Ratlam in between. And one mm. of my sister-in-law was also there for some time in the Ratlam. So I've been to Ratlam. It's a good place, and this namkin of the Ratlam is. आपने हमारे लिए टाइम निकाला थैंक यू मेरे को भी सुनने को और सीखने को मिला <laughs> nothing we all learn from each other yes. we all learn from each other and from the patients maximum that we learn from the patients yes thanks to all the okay okay namaskar thank you team pharmacist bye 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 ma'am sir hai abhi koi queries ho to to pata hai kya ma'am पूर्णिमा मैडम गुड इवनिंग अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ मैडम मैडम आपको कुछ पूछना हो तो सर से भी मेरे से तो कोई कुछ नहीं पूछेगा <laughs> मैं निकलता हूँ <laughs> कुछ पेशेंट बैठे होंगे तो मैं निपटा देता हूँ ओके थैंक यू सर ओके थैंक यू मैम थैंक यू एवरी वन फॉर ज्वाइनिंग विथ अस